but we have to always think about ourselves like that proverbial Sankofa bird that flew away but at the same time was looking back to see what's going on back there because in the history of this whole world ladies and gentlemen do not forget this in the history of the world the only people who have come to truly help those that are oppressed are those who used to be oppressed before but were able to flee into safety but looked back Countries around the world are competing for resources, and prime among those resources is human capital. When talent consistently leaves the country of birth for opportunities abroad, it creates a persistent drag on the home country's economy and blights its growth, a phenomenon recognized as brain drain. While brain drain affects the developed world, England, for example, sees over 1.1 million university graduates living and working outside of the country. The pain is most keenly felt in developing countries. A high proportion of high-skilled immigrants do not return to the home country. Overall, up to one-fifth of students who study abroad do not come back, at least not immediately, and there is evidence that those who go for their master's and PhD are least likely to return. An estimated 70% of Chinese students who study overseas never return to their homeland, and around half of African inventors live outside their home country. Something you did go around town People who they go downtown Some people they stand around You wanna know go downtown Them say the chief He they sleep with the chief wife I bog it for corner He they sleep with the chief wife The neighbor daughter Carry belly for the chief child out in the United States in 2006, 37% of Nigerians held bachelor's degrees, 17% held master's degrees, while 4% of Nigerians went ahead to get their PhD. In contrast, the same census data showed only 19% of white Americans had bachelor's degrees, 8% held master's degrees, and only 1% held doctorates. Decisions, decisions, one lucky, not to mention exceptionally smart high school senior hit the Ivy League jackpot. And as John Donvan reports, she's not the first from her school to get the star treatment. Augusta Uamanzuna aimed high when she applied for college this year. I knew that I wanted to go somewhere where I would learn a lot and where I would, you know, challenge myself academically. And so she tried for the Ivy League, those eight storied schools, which typically let in fewer than 15% of those who apply and sometimes far less. Now, everyone knows that Augusta is a star in class and she's an athlete. She plays badminton and a leader, in fact, part of Future Leaders of America. Harold Eke is a senior at Elmont Memorial High School. He joins us live now. Congratulations. Thank you. For all the parents watching right now <laughs> whose kids want to go to a great college, how did you do it? Well, you, t you, you know all about opportunities. You came to this country from Nigeria at age eight. Yeah, eight years old. And in the beginning, could people understand what you were saying? No, not really. I spoke with a very like thick accent, and, and like I'd say it, it was difficult trying to like adapt right. to the new environment and absorb you know every everything the new culture. But uh, my parents set a very good example for me and my. And your parents brothers. were yeah. doctors or something like that? Uh, no, they were just like they worked at Target at first. When they, they were clerks at Target. Yeah, they definitely struggled, you know, to like find stable jobs to support my family. So, a lot of the times you see our parents here in America working multiple jobs. You can see them, they have a, jo a job where he's working, your father is working as, as a nurse, or an adjunct professor in school, but then at night he's driving cab. If you look at your family, look at the way you guys are living, the fact that both your parents are working, you should be able to think about it as an adult child and be like, I think that this main job that my father is working should be able to take care of the bills in this house. But it's not just about you guys. He is not only taking care of himself and his family here, he's taking care of an extended family back home. A graduate with a BSc now cannot do more in Lagos than be a cook, 
a secretary or a cleaner. And let me tell you, it's not easy. We're already competing for that position now. A lot of people, they will not employ Nigerians. Do you know who they prefer to employ? They prefer to employ Togolese people, Togolese and Ghanaians. Imagine. So tell me, what, what's Lagos doing for me? You will come and meet me now, for instance. Guy, I want to go to Libya. I don't know where I want to go. I say, I can, no problem. Go bring 150k, come. Then I will convey you to Libya successfully without any harms. Though it's God all the way. If Nigeria was a better country, I never believed anybody would take that risk through Sahara Desert, nor the Mediterranean Sea. On my last trip to Libya, I came across a series of graduates on that journey, like me. Even people that graduate from private universities, I have no choice. I never feel good maybe becoming into all these old things, trafficking people from here to Libya. I'm never happy with it. But it's a situation of things I have to survive. The video CNN published reportedly shows African migrants being showcased by auctioneers as if they were property as smugglers sell them to the highest bidder, some for as little as $400 each. Prostitution is not a work. We should stop it. It's thought between 200,000 and 400,000 women across Europe are forced to work as prostitutes. An increasing number of them are Nigerian, like the woman we just heard. They're lured to Europe with false promises and end up in backstreet brothels or red light districts in cities like Lyon, Madrid, or here in Turin. Here in Africa today, you have the youngest population in the world, more than 200 million young people live in the continent. And these young people have no education, no opportunities, no access to health care, no access to... Basically, their future is very, very blurry for them. And then when they look at social media to see what's going on to their counterparts around the world, they want to live like that. And they're risking their lives, basically, to take these boats and, and, and try to cross on the other side, chasing a dream sometimes that doesn't exist. You should see how the people believe still. They say help from heaven will come soon. Oh, oh, brother. Oh, oh, I still remember. I'm not saying that we have to move back, ladies and gentlemen, but we have to have the same mentality that those great people had. What was their mentality? We are in exile. I left my home country not because I wanted it, but because I had to. I left it for survival. I did not leave it for another man's land to go and enjoy and just stay there. I left it so that way I can do better, so I can turn around and help.